Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show in the wake of President Trump's state visit to the UK. True to form, the President caused complete consternation before he arrived, casting diplomatic protocol to the four winds. Even before he stepped gingerly down the steps of Air Force One, he had blatantly intervened in the Conservative Party leadership race, told outgoing Prime Minister Theresa May why she'd made a muck of Brexit, and engaged in a mid-air Twitter spat with London Mayor Sadiq Khan. However, perhaps the calming influence of Her Majesty the Queen put the President on his best behaviour for the ceremonial part of the visit. This contrast was brilliantly summed up as pomp and acrimony in the Moreland cartoon in The Times. The presidential arrival also provoked mass protest. The Speaker of the House of Commons put paid to any plan of addressing parliamentarians in Westminster Hall, but his baby balloon effigy was given special permission by the Mayor of London to fly over them. And so in this show, we start a two-part examination of the politics of protest. In an upcoming show, we'll draw a contrast between working-class Glasgow taking to the mean streets a century ago and middle-class London of today taking to the theatrical boards to campaign against HS2. However, this week, the man at the centre of the storm is Donald J. Trump, and we take a look at the effectiveness or otherwise of the protests which have been ranged against him. But in this televisual and interconnected age, what form of protest actually works best? Is it to put hundreds of thousands onto the streets like the people's vote? Or is it most effective to lace the message with humour, like the Led by Donkeys campaign projecting onto Big Ben, disparaging remarks by Boris Johnson about Trump before he became president? Alex talks to one of the organisers of this week's anti-Trump protests. It was against our government for colluding with Trump and the things that he does, uh, and it was to send solidarity to the American people who are resisting his policies domestically. And we take a look back at great protests of the past, with the man behind the legendary Rock Against Racism protests of the late 1970s, which for the first time mobilised the music industry behind a great national cause and struck a chord, which has been copied many times since. Out of all that fantastic kind of cultural activity came things like Live Aid and WOMAD and Peter Gable's things all came after Ra. But first year tweets, messages and emails in response to our show of last week. Bob says... Labour and Tory support in Scotland has never recovered, but it's being assumed they'll reappear and re-establish the status quo. I don't think so. Trust in both of the majors has been waning, so I expect that the seismic shift will remain past the next general election. David says, good balanced lineup of guests. Ray says, Scotland had a referendum on quitting England and going alone, but the Scottish voted to stay. Now I think we here in England should have our referendum to see if the English want you with us. And I think the answer would be no. Go. Please just go back over the border where you belong. Rennie says, Westminster is a puppet parliament. Brexit fiasco proves it. And finally, Barry says, I think England should have a referendum for independence and let Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland sort themselves out. Now, before the president even arrived, he was courting controversy. Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage were waiting for the invitation to tea and Meghan Markle was accused of making nasty comments for her pre-royal family suggestion that his misogyny may not make the president one of the great healers of politics. However, Donald Trump does have the ability to bring people together. The warring factions in the Labour Party laid their differences aside to join in the anti-Trump protest, while the parliamentary leaders of Labour and the SNP linked arms to boycott to state dinner. But what was the aim of the mass protest and who was it aimed at? The audience at home or abroad? Alex has protest organiser Shabir Laka, the key questions. And now I'm delighted to be joined by Shabir Laka, one of the organisers of the Stop the War Coalition who've been behind the anti-Trump demonstrations this week. Shabir, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thanks for having me. Now, I'm interested in the aim of this week's demonstration and who your target audience were. Who were you trying to impress? Was it people in the UK or was it American citizens? You know, what was the, the target behind your anti-Trump demonstration? Yeah, well, our aim was uh, to show visible opposition to Donald Trump and to say that he's not welcome here, that the things that he stands for are what we stand against. Um, and for that reason, our target audience was the, the people of Britain uh, who came out to protest against him. It was against our government for colluding with Trump and the things that he does. Uh, and it was to send solidarity to the American people who are resisting his policies domestically. But let's spin back, you know, 15 years or so. I mean, Donald Trump famously says he was a, an anti-Iraq war campaigner. So maybe 15 years ago, he might have been 
out demonstrating with you against himself. <laughs> Although he has said that uh, in his eyes the solution was to just go to Iraq and, and take the oil without any pretenses. Um, and, you know, I mean, what we've seen even from his rallies uh, before he became president was that he preaches this kind of anti-war rhetoric because that's what his base want to hear. But in reality, we see him supporting Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, pushing for war with Iran, uh, increasing tensions with North Korea, um, and various other flashpoints across the, the globe. And in effect, he's made the world a much less safe place. But on North Korea, I mean, let, let's uh, say he brings off what he described as the greatest deal ever <laughs> uh, and secures a a demilitarization of the Korean Peninsula, wouldn't that make the American president one of the world's greatest peacemakers? Well, I don't think it would be uh, down to him primarily, to be honest. I think it would be uh, the willingness of the Korean people to reach peace despite America's historic role in, in stopping that. But you only have to contrast that with him pulling out of the Iran nuclear uh, agreement and sending warships and potentially 1,500 or more troops uh, to Iran to see that this isn't about peace, this is about more geopolitics, it is about American imperialism. Well, it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea, that's for sure, but, I mean, he did get elected. I mean, Donald Trump won a democratic election. So isn't there a case that uh, you should respect the office even if you disagree with the man? Well, I think we have to look at what he's done once he's come into office. One of the first things he did was implement a Muslim ban. Uh, this is a man who's been caught on tape bragging about sexual assault, uh, he's locked refugee children in cages, and at least six of whom have died, uh, and thousands are said to not be uh, able to be reunited with their families. This is not the kind of person who, elected or not, we should be legitimizing or normalizing or looking up to in any way, let alone maintaining close relations the way this Tory government is doing uh, and supporting in his uh, wars abroad and in, in, in his foreign policy rhetoric. Uh, we have to be opposed to that, and primarily because we have this special relationship with the United States, we are in a position to impact uh, that relationship and, and what he's doing. Now, you're a, a veteran, uh, a young age, but still a veteran of a range of protests. When you're on one of your big marches, like this week, do you ever sort of think, oh my goodness, you know, here we are marching, this is great, showing great solidarity, but what about all these folk that can't get to work? Are they not <laughs> going to be turned off our cause because of the inconvenience? Well, I think the aim of the demonstration is to stop business as usual. And that, unfortunately, does mean that people can't get to work and are delayed, etc. But that is part of sending the message. And it is to show primarily to our government and those who, who rule this country that we won't sit by and let things carry on as normal while they behave this way in a way that we clearly oppose. But it does send a message to the public as well uh, that there is a movement willing to take to the streets, willing to disrupt the status quo uh, to get our message heard, and they should join us. So what do you think the, the balance is between a reasonably conventional demonstration, albeit one which says it's not business as usual, but nonetheless, a pretty conventional demonstration like we've seen this week, and, uh, and the elements of humour like the... The, the Trump blimp or, or the, the Trump robot who does some rude things. So where do you think the balance between conventional demonstration and a, a touch of humour lies? Well, I think the more ways we can show our opposition, the better. And I think it's a testament uh, to the British people that humour can be involved in acts of resistance, such as uh, the Trump baby balloon and, and other things. But we can't discount the role of the demonstration itself, the, the the very act of a mass mobilization on the streets with thousands of people, many of whom have never demonstrated before, who during the course of that demonstration hear new arguments, meet like-minded people, have a, a raising of their consciousness, a very active uh, presence of solidarity, uh, I think it's, it's very important. And can you point to, I mean, if we think a generation back again, the Iraq war, huge demonstration famously, but the war went ahead. Can you point to recent examples of of demonstrations which have actually changed the course of events or changed the, the course of history? Well, I think looking at the Iraq war demonstration itself, although the war went ahead, uh, that demonstration had a fundamental impact on British politics. Uh, we know that Tony Blair and politicians uh, were looking to invade other Middle Eastern countries after the Iraq war, which they were then put off from following the mass show of opposition. Uh, we saw Ed Miliband in 2013 uh, refused to go along with bombing Syria for that very reason. Um, and to look at other demonstrations which have had impacts, uh, you can look at the youth climate strikers and Extinction Rebellion and the impact they've had 
uh, of putting climate change on the agenda, of making Parliament declare a climate emergency, uh, and all these things. And you can look at, at other European countries. In France, for example, you look at the Gilets jaunes. It's happening everywhere, and you can see the impact. Uh, tell me a bit about the, the, the nature of demonstrations in terms of the, the social complexity. I mean, most people watching the programme probably wouldn't have been on many demonstrations. So it, are they predominantly a, a young audience? Is it all sections of the community? Uh, I, I did see some pretty old age pensioners uh, demonstrating in the Extinction Rebellion. So what, what, what is the nature and, and complexion of the demonstrations that you organise? Well, I think it's very diverse, and particularly the anti-Trump uh, demonstrations. We've seen people of, of all ages, um, a lot of young people, but also a lot of veteran campaigners uh, from, for example, the anti-nuclear weapons movement, etc. It's a reflection, I think, on the organizations that have helped to call the demonstrations, where we see uh, the biggest trade unions in the country uh, resulting in a, in a big show of the labor movement out on the streets. Uh, but also most of the social campaigning organizations and mass movements that reach across communities uh, who are being affected by various policies. Um, and I think that's really represented on the demonstrations. And how about in the, the Extinction re Rebellion? I mean, there were school strikes. Uh, the outgoing prime minister was very upset about them. And I, I imagine some parents had a bit of concern as well. I mean, is that something you encourage in the a weekday demonstrations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been down to the, to the school strikes against climate, and what I've seen is young people who are incredibly clued on on what's going on. They understand the danger uh, that is facing society, and particularly their futures, uh, and they're fighting back against the patronizing narrative that is present in the media and among politicians, uh, that these young people don't have a clue about what's going on, that they should stay in school and leave it to the adults. Well, the adults haven't done anything about this, and that's why they're taking a stand. And they're very conscious of the fact that they're taking a day of school. This is a, an act of resistance on the streets. Um, and I think it should be encouraged and replicated as much as possible. Well, with your experience of demonstration, have you a favourite moment from, from one of the, the big demos that you've been on? Is there something you can say, <laughs> well, I was glad I was there to see that? <laughs> Well, I think probably last year's demonstration against Trump, uh, you know, with 250,000 people, was probably a highlight, I think, in seeing so many people who clearly have never been on a demonstration before who are out there, uh, you know, making their voices heard in a very clear uh, and energetic way. Uh, I take the role of, of chanting on demonstrations, and, and I think that's a, a great thing to do. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's kind of one of my favorite moments. <laughs> Okay, a leap of the imagination. Let's just for a, a second imagine that uh, I'm Donald Trump and I'm the <laughs> President of the United States and I, I'm here having a conversation with somebody who's demonstrating against me. What would be the key message you'd want to get across to the President? You should step down <laughs> immediately. <laughs> well, I, I don't know I mean, if I can secure a, a presidential resignation. But what I can certainly do is present you with the... The Alex Salmon Quake. The, the Scots Gaelic for a loving cup. You put uh, a, a fluid, preferably whiskey, but obviously a soft drink, if, <laughs> if applicable, in the Quake and pass it around your, uh, your close friends. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. the interview. No problem. Thank you. One of the breakthroughs in the history of protest was in the late 1970s, when under the slogan, Love Music, Hate Racism, some of the great rock bands of the era were mobilised to fight the rise of racism in that day. Join us after the break when Alex interviews the artist behind that initiative, Red Saunders. Welcome back. Now, 40 years after its first launch, Rock Against Racism has acquired folklore status and become the, the template for many later movements, mobilising the music industry to promote great causes. Now, I'm joined by the man behind that initiative, Red Saunders, to talk about protest then and now. So, Rock Against Racism, that's way back to 1976. What was the genesis behind uh, Rock Against Racism? It was a really simple thing, actually, Alex. It was uh, an outburst by the guitar god Eric Clapton, who made a complete racist outburst supporting Enoch Powell at a concert in Birmingham. It was reported in the music press. I was an old Eric Clapton fan. I had all his records and everything. And I was outraged, because that music is based on black music. So I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter proposing that we started a campaign against racism in music to bring black and white musicians together called Rock Against Racism. And that was in the New Musical Express, New which Musical was Express. The, the Bible of, yeah. uh, of, of music. And, and the Melody Maker and Sounds and Black Echoes and the Left Press. So 
how did, that was it. You're I, telling me this mass movement started with a, a letter. A letter. And I, I really thought not much about it. I mean, I was angry, so I wrote the letter and it was done. I don't write letters very often, you know. And uh, I didn't really think about it much. And somebody called me up. At, um, it was an old friend of mine who was a journalist. And he called up and said, oh, he'd organised a P.O. box to replies to be addressed to. And he said, there's, uh, there's 400 letters here. I went, what? What are you talking about? And that was it. Now, for the benefit of the viewers, this is long before the internet, long before email, where you, you set up a, a, a post box to get the response to yeah, your absolutely. rallying cry. Yeah, and you, you say in those days, you set up a post box because you didn't put an individual address, because if you did, the NF would be firebombing your address. These were dangerous times. So we had set up a post box. So we were stunned when we got, and the letters were just amazing. So what was your message back to, to well, the people who rallied one, to the banner? I remember one particular letter from a young uh, a school student, a young girl in Aberystwyth. And she wrote, and she said, I read your letter in Melody Maker. And she said, I've got a geography teacher who's a Nazi. And I hate racism and I love music. And, um, you know, what will I do? And so I wrote a letter back to her, as was the style of that time. That was what has to happen. I wrote a letter and it just said, right, Susan, you are a rock against racism, Aberystwyth. Get on with it. And one of the things that came out of it as well was... The people who were at the centre of Ra were all 60s people who'd been through the 60s. They'd been through Vietnam solidarity, lovings, hippie dope, everything. We'd, so they had some experience of organising things and putting on festivals and gigs. So it, it wasn't totally new to them. Was there a concert you know, which emerged that you, you sort of went to and said, my goodness, look where we are now, having, yeah. having started with a letter? Unbelievable. I mean, when we did the uh, Victoria Park, Carnival with um, Steel Pulse, who came out dressed in... That was 78. That was 78. So we had The Clash, who were the leading political punk band at that time. We had Tom Robinson, who was at that time just had the hit with Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay. Yeah. So you had all the politics, not just racism, but everything about oppression was mixed up. Steel Pulse came on stage, black reggae band from Hansworth in Birmingham, came on stage dressed in Ku Klux Klan outfits and sang their song, Clue Klux Klang. It was just incredible. And so uh, that gig had Polly Styrin, who, who, who's passed away, sadly, who sang the incredible song, Oh, Bondage Up Yours, as a young punk feminist. And I remember running out on stage, I was comparing the gig, and I remember running out onto stage, and I just was overwhelmed with the amount of people. And I just screamed, This ain't no Woodstock. This is the carnival against the Nazis. And the crowd just went, Wah! And it just carried us through the rest of the day. And it's a, it was a blur. It was such an incredible moment in my life. I look back and people say, oh, do you remember when you... And I said, no, I don't remember anything, mate. It, it just went into vapour. So Rockets Racism, it was about, was it six years or so, would you say, was the period yeah. of it? Yeah. It was really from... It was like a shooting star, really. Mm -hmm. And when people tried to start it up again, I said, no, you're never going to do that. It was unique to its moment. Absolutely. It was that time and that time only. You know, the train came in the station and on the platform was these reggae musicians milling about and these punks milling about and they all stepped on the train and off we went on this incredible journey. It was That's from 76 effect. to 82. But these six years, these six short years, had big effects. I mean, in terms of the, well, some groups emerged as a result of Rock Against Racism, uh, but also in terms of making music uh, an accepted accepted medium to get a political message across. Out of all that fantastic kind of cultural activity came things like Live Aid and WOMAD and Peter Gable's things all came after Ra. You've been a, a political activist uh, uh, all your days uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, a photographer which is your, your profession uh, and uh, an interest in the theatre and when you came to the studio today you, you'd come through the, the anti-Trump protest. What was your view of the, the style of the, uh, the, the protest against the American president's state visit? Well, I, I was on the, the protest myself, and it was just absolutely one of the most extraordinary demos I've seen in years, because it was a beautiful... The, the sun was amazing, and the whole of Trafalgar Square was full, and late in the afternoon, when the sun comes across Trafalgar Square, and there was just, I don't know, three-quarters of a million people. So it was absolutely incredible. And the manifestations of all the little things that people had done, like the baby Trump and all the rest of it, and all the handmade banners. I remember 
um, someone had a picture of Trump and it said, um, you like comb over. You know, and it was like, it was just, there was just so much yeah, going on. We shall on. overcome. Yeah, well, that's it, we shall <laughs> overcome. And it reminded me, like, you know, if I wasn't an old geezer like I am now, you know, I'd have been on the streets doing our agitprop theatre in the middle of that because there was people dressed up and people doing all sorts of incredible activities. So, you know, it took me way back. Ed, let's talk about, about your, your own career as a photographer because you have a very substantial uh, career in that art form. I, I, is your photography politically orientated as well? Is that, I mean, uh, would you describe uh, photography as a, a form which you can get a message across? Absolutely, now especially. Before, no. Before I separated my commercial life and my cultural and political life. Sometimes they'd overlap or I'd use my photographic skills to help political campaigns or whatever, but they were pretty separated. I had a young family to bring up and all the rest of it. Um, but now, in the last 10 years, the better part of a decade now, I've been doing my hidden project about hidden working class history, and that is 100%. Tell us a bit about this. You've got an exhibition in Manchester. Yeah. I have an exhibition opening in Manchester um, this week, and um, it's about the Peterloo Massacre, because it's 200 years since the Peterloo Massacre, and all the commemorations are going on all year. I've been looking, my project looks at hidden working class history. And basically, very simply, I just shine photographic light on these momentous events that have been overlooked. But how can you photograph something which was just before the dawn of photography in the, in the case well, of Peter Lou? Well, what I do is I use the method of the French tableau, tableau vivant, where you, you use all the props of art, culture, painting, theatre, opera, and you, the Victorians started this, and the French at that time, where they'd bring together these elements to make images, and then they'd cut out elements, they'd cut out the negatives, and they'd put them all together to make big images. And I, I just do the same thing, uh, but I use the modern technology, which enables me to do a group of 300 people for Tuppence Ha'penny, because I shoot them all as friends. Everyone's a volunteer. And I shoot them three at a time, four at a time, some at two o'clock, some at eight o'clock. And I save money and put these events together. And they're 100% they've political work, yeah. And you think in terms of things like Peter Lewis, you know, something which, unfortunately, for many English school children will never have heard of. Yeah. Some will. Uh, but uh, you think it's the lack of images, which is uh, in a, a, an age which is driven by, by images. You think that's one of the reasons why they, they can be written out of history? I think that's so. It's one of my motivations is to hope that my images bring these things back to life so people are able to go, well, what was that all about? It is a fantastic method. of It's, it's very cinematographic. You, you do take, you know, but my project ends when photography begins. So I don't do anything from 1850 on. So according to you, photography is very much a part of the politics of protest. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Red, to haste you on the, the way to, uh, to Manchester, I can present you with the Alex Salmon Quake. Now, you know the drill, whiskey, only scotch in the quake, yeah. and then pass it round all these friends you've been... Wow, that's very, very kind of you, Alex. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you, Red. <laughs> Fantastic. The state visit to the United Kingdom of the 45th President of the United States is only the third ever accorded to a sitting president. Reagan, Eisenhower, Kennedy are three of the substantial occupants of the White House never accorded such an accolade. Only Trump himself would evaluate his presidency in that category. Now, if the British calculation is that Donald J. Trump is vulnerable to flattery, then that's undoubtedly correct. This is the most narcissistic and thin-skinned American president in history. However, if the calculation is that pomp and ceremony will somehow influence his negotiating behaviour, in any upcoming post-Brexit trade deal, then it is a serious misreading of the Donald's intelligence and guile. This president is not known for giving any sucker an even break. So how best to conduct protests against such a man? Public opinion is divided on the issue. A substantial majority dislike the president and all his works. This is not surprising given the ever-growing Trump library of offensive comments and prejudiced opinions. However, a narrow majority of the public would not ban the visit, perhaps believing that respecting the office takes precedence over honouring the individual. Thus, the organisers of this week's protests faced a tightrope in judging tactics. 
In the event, their balance was probably correct. Numbers are important, but they are not the be-all and end-all. More impactful in puncturing the Trump ego is humour. And here Trump's unprecedented social media access and accessibility is important. Most often, protesters are kept well out of sight of those protested against. However, any anti-Trump campaigner can have the virtual guarantee that their protest will register with the president. He may not always get the joke, but it's enough to know he will certainly read the message, take it personally, and if you're very lucky, regale against it in one of his famous early hours Diet coke fueled rebuttals. In this sense, social media is now the weapon of choice for both the president and his detractors. Not so much swords at dawn, but tweets in the early light. The stakes could not be higher, as victory in this duel will dictate the politics of the planet for the next generation. Protest politics is more varied in this modern age. Social media has opened up new opportunities, but also has made mass organisation much easier to bolster traditional marches and rallies. When Rock Against Racism broke the mould, Red Sanders and his comrades took to the columns of the new Musical Express to galvanise support. Ten years later, Live Aid broadcast to hundreds of millions. Now such a campaign would reach billions through the social media. Our second show in The Politics of Protest will chart this transition and examine what it means for the success or otherwise of campaigns. Next week, however, we turn to the leadership contest which will determine the UK's next Prime Minister and which, ironically, now rivals the Eurovision Song Contest for the number of entries. Join us to find out who is likely to prevail and who will end up with nil point. Until then, from Taz, myself and the rest of the team, it's goodbye for now.